Hi Stephen, lovely to meet you and start doing some work on your game during your visit. Uh, just a quick recap on the key points that we covered. Um, main two areas really for the from the swing standpoint were to improve this rate of closure that you had when viewed from down the line. So we have a, or initially we had a very high exit. So the hands would exit the body um, above the lead shoulder and the club face as a result would be wrapping over quite severely. Uh, shot patterns could be quite erratic. You could potentially slice the ball severely with your driver, um, but the shot you were experiencing on the first morning was more that drag to the left with your iron shot. And then the other change we wanted to look at was just the overall setup when viewed from face on and making it more appropriate, making it a little bit more um, user friendly and just building your understanding up of some key aspects of your game, how they relate to the ball flight and giving you that way of articulating to yourself what you need to do when out on the golf course, what you need to do when you're practicing and also a way of explaining the bad shots to yourself. You know, the reality of golf is that you're going to hit bad shots and there's nothing worse than hitting bad shots and not understanding why. So we're looking at developing a way of you explaining your game to yourself. That was the goal and that was the ultimate goal. And I think based on the day that we had at Formby, um, I think you demonstrated that very well. You had a lot of good shots. When you hit the poor one, you didn't panic. You you just stuck to your task, stuck to the process, just added more of the same. It was interesting. We had a little chat going down. I think it was the 13th and the shoulders had just crept open. You'd start to demonstrate this setup, certainly with the upper body a little bit more. Um, I talked to you about maybe just sort of keeping the chest back. I think you, in your words, it was curved spine. And as soon as you did that, you got the swing back. You started hitting the ball um, more to your liking and, you know, you enjoyed the rest of your round. So that's exactly what I was looking for um, from your visit at the start. It's not easy. We had to break everything down. Uh, and we, we nearly lost you at lunch at Formby Hall. Um, but, you know, again, little chat breaking it down, simplest form, using the images that we used or the overall image with Steve Stricker at the end of the of the week, just to give you the right feels and the right images to take it on the golf course and you were flying again. So technically more appropriate setup and reducing the rate of closure and looking at why the club face was doing what it was doing. That was the bulk of the work so if we just have a quick look at your probably one of your best swings that you made towards the end of your visit and we'll just compare the two just for your record so that you can see the differences see the changes that we made just as a recap you can see there you put in that position in that curved spine when you're out on the course at Formby the upper body started to creep a little bit more than what you saw there and you just had to put that move in and it's realistic to expect that you know when we have a bad day we're going to revert back to something very similar or something slightly similar to what we see on the left so on the left the big issue is that we've got the upper center which is the center of the shoulder turn out in front of the lower center when you do that at setup that's producing quite a steep angle of attack all things being equal so what you're going to have to do now is during your downswing you're going to have to shallow out that angle of attack and that causes you to drop the weight back that causes the hands to scoop or flip a little bit as you described it so there's some of your problems straight away the other thing that we see in your setup is that your foot positioning is not necessarily ideal for creating a free turn so we've got square toes at setup which is positioning the knees inwards which is restricting the turn potentially of the hips and we've also got a lower center and an upper center beg your pardon I put that dot in the right place we've got a lower center and an upper center that are misaligned creating an axis tilt or a side bend that is more towards the target 
which is conducive for all things being equal to quite a steep angle of attack. And then during the downswing, you're going to start to shallow out the angle of attack. So we take a little look at your swing. Upper centre starts to drop back. As you can see now that the centre of the shoulders is not as far forward as it was at address. And you've shallowed out the angle of attack. So upper centre now is back. Lower centre is forward. The side bend is away from the target. Which is shallowing out the angle of attack. Now the problem is when we make that move, if we do it a little bit too much, let's say for whatever reason, uh, on a certain day, we just tilted back this way a little bit too much, angle of attack would be a little bit too shallow, and we'd hit the ground behind the ball. And then in order to prevent that from happening, as we saw with the 3D footage, the left arm would start to bend. So the wrist angle's coming out, is your idea of releasing the club which in turn potentially widens the arc we talked about that quite a bit but from a from a purely swing standpoint upper centre too far forward at address falling back in transition onto the yellow line which is shallowing out the angle of attack and on this particular shot we timed it alright, we shallowed it out enough, we just bent the left arm enough, and we just released the club enough to get the job done, but that's not going to work consistently, I mean, just by its nature, if you hear the, listen to the description there, everything has to be done just enough, and that's not what we want when we're under pressure on the golf course. So what we did at setup was establish a much more appropriate starting point instead of the upper center being in front of the lower center the lower center now is out in front of the upper center which is more where we are when we're at address now put my ticket back in when you're at impact so you can see the impact position that you're establishing here now is being preset at P1. What we've also done is we have turned the feet out. So as the feet turn out, maybe 30, 35 degrees with each foot, the knees are out more, which makes it easier for you to turn the hips during the backswing. Doesn't mean it's a guarantee, but it just makes it easier. Which means the inward movement of the arms, so when Peter's asked you to work the arms in and not lift the arms as much, is easier to achieve. So it's, this is all about, this setup is all about making things just easier, more user-friendly, more appropriate. Yeah, we want to get the arms in. We want to have a relatively shallow angle of attack. We don't want to be too steep. But we don't want to go from steep to shallow. We just want to establish what we're looking for at impact. Now, we showed you Steve Stricker on day three. And the, the similarities between his impact position and his setup position were uncanny. Um, so we were talking about a player there who uh, reinvented himself, was very good, then just completely lost his game. And then went away a couple of years, no one saw him came back, reinvented himself. And the, and the things that are noticeable are, as we said there, the similarities between where he is at setup and where he is at impact and how he uses the risk condition. He, he, he presets the sort of risk condition that he's looking for through the hit and sort of keeps it locked in there. So that's the sort of pattern that we're trying to create for you, something that's lower maintenance, that doesn't require you to be out on the range for hours on end, and that doesn't change dramatically from one day to the next. Okay, so that's what we're looking to achieve. So creating that sort of preset impact position at P1 so that we can then return to that position more easily at P7. So you can see there now that the chest dropped back a little bit, pelvis pushed forward a little 
everything's a little bit further back than it was at setup, which is all right. I mean, if it happens, it happens. Um, ideally, it would be forward of that. But again, the better you get at executing things, the better that's going to be. But you can see there's very little change between setup and impact. Whereas the one on the left, there's a tremendous change between where you are at setup and where you are at impact. Very little similarity there between the two. As we came through the hit, we talked about keeping the wrist firmer, not rolling the hands as much. And how rolling the club introduced too much chaos into the swing. Um, and I use the scenario, if someone was coming to see me for a lesson and they wanted to play the worst golf imaginable, that was the goal that they established at the start of the lesson. <coughs> I would do three things. I would get them initially anyway. I would get them to move the weight from side to side. I would get them to lift the arms up and down off the chest. And I would get them to roll the club face as much as they could. In order for the club face to roll less, we need to allow the head to release which allows the body to continue to turn. The foot position at P1 being flared out more is allowing the turn, both sides of the ball, to happen more freely. It's not a guarantee, but it's allowing it to. It's a more appropriate position to have the feet. And the idea, the overall principle of keeping the eye on the ball as opposed to keeping the head down is why the club on the left overtakes the hands slightly quicker and rolls slightly more than the club on the right. So feet turned out, pelvis pushed forward. It's going to take you back to your dress position there on the left as well. The changes that you've made walk you through these now and, and again you've got the board uh, the images of the board of you writing it down you put it in your own words but in my explanation here I would be having both feet turned out pelvis push forward keeping the centre of the shoulders in the centre of the stance and that really is your setup uh, encapsulated in as few words as I can use at this moment in time. So you've got feet turned out, pelvis pushed forward, keep the chest in the centre of the stance. You worded that differently, but the, that's my recap of your setup changes. You're presetting the sort of geometry that you want at impact. And then it's just a reminder of where you want to then swing to. You're going to have to move, got to be done. Um, but obviously having a, a nice clear feel of right I'm in that position that's set up that's where I want to be move away from it and then move back to it uh, as quickly as you can starts to get the job done in a much more consistent manner if we take a little look at it down the line so we've we've changed the setup during the downswing we don't have to drop the head back as much we're not keeping the head down for as long and when we looked at it originally, when we were keeping the head down too long and the head was moving up, the spine was moving away from the target in the downswing, we see that the club face rate of closure is quite high and we see that the hands are exiting sort of slightly above the lead shoulder. When we take a little look at you from down the line on, let's get it up on here for a second. So it's easy toward the end of the visit. And we're looking at the exit only on this one. We're releasing the head a little bit more. The hands now are exiting beneath the lead shoulder. And the rate of closure on the club face 
is starting to calm down a little bit, which means the miss to the left was less of an issue. So that predominantly was due to you releasing the head and doing much less with the wrist. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get a little video up of you demonstrating some different wrist angles just to remind you of the impact that the wrists have on the club face. Okay, so here we've swung through to a position where we've got a club face that's closing slightly to the arc. And we talked about keeping the wrist firmer through the hit. We use the drill with the cold angle, we use the image of Stricker. Um, various ideas throughout your visit, various drills. But a big one was understanding the effect of the wrist conditions on the, the, the sort of relationship between the face and the path. So on this one, I've put you sort of where we want to have you. As you can see, the toe end of the club's pointing skyward, lead wrist pretty firm. One of the issues you had originally was the idea of keeping the left wrist flatter or firmer was producing this sort of look through the hip where the back of the gloved hand would point to the sky. The problem with that is the sweet spot now points more to the sky, so you, therefore you're opening the face to the path. And when you do that, you get a lot of shots that would shoot out to the right on you. And when you did it excessively, you run the risk of hitting the odd shank. So one of the moves that you created in, in an attempt maybe to prevent the club closing down too quick was this move, which is not correct. We then, we looked at what sort of move you would historically have made, which is we could drop the handle, let the club pass the hands pretty quickly. And that in turn can shift the swing direction too much to the left. And again, cause the sweet spot to fall open a little bit. So again, you could get things like fades with the driver, um, but what you could also do in doing that is you could also roll the club too much to prevent that happening. You can see here now, we talked about Stricker having higher hands and a more arched lead wrist. So the feeling when you were doing the partial shots was to keep the wrist bone of the lead wrist higher than the sweet spot as you came through. And as you do that, that allows you to continue hitting out at the ball for longer. And closes the face fractionally to the path. Which when you did it correctly was a nice little draw shot that you were getting. When you were demonstrating elements of that, so say executing it more, but maybe not as much as you could. The shot pattern was still tight, it was still functional and you'd take it every day of the week on the golf course so it's learning the relationship between the hands and the leading edge the condition of the wrists and the face to path and if you can do that you're a long way to explaining the types of shots that you get when you're out on a golf course uh, so the other things we looked at were your bunker skills we talked about when you're in a bunker the biggest thing you've got to consider is your speed you have to keep you speed up when you're in a bunker. If you were doing just one thing correctly in the bunker, you would want to make sure that you've got, you know, once you've got enough loft in your hand to clear the lip that's in front of you, to keep your speed up. The more speed you have, the more chance the ball's got of coming out. If you catch it a little bit heavy, the sand will still get the ball out of the bunker. If you strike it correctly, you'll get the good shot that you experience. The minute the speed diminishes, the ball won't come out the bunker consistently. So got to keep the speed up when you're in the bunker. The other thing we looked at was your... Towards the end, it was a shot that you caught a little bit thin and then a shot that you really, really sort of struck well. And I've got these two swings up here now for you. I'm just going to take you to your impact position. And you've got the stills of these coming through as well. Uh, the one that you catch thin is the one on the left. 
at impact the heads drop back fractionally more there's fractionally more tilt in the shoulders so that move that you know you used to be here at setup moving to here at impact you just demonstrated that second move a little bit on this one um, whereas the swing on the right you're sort of like this at setup and you're like that at impact so there's been less tilting back of the spine shafts forward a little bit more and as you come through the hit you can see that the lead arm just doesn't quite bend as much and the wrist stays flatter for longer you can see there you can still see the gloved hand on the one on the right head releases a little bit more as a result of that so the swing on the left was just thin slightly it wasn't a bad shot you take it I think the comment was that you know I'm, I'm off 18 I'll take that all day long uh, and I can't say I blame you but you're just seeing elements of what you would default back to your old way of doing things heads drop back a little bit or spines drop back a little bit Therefore, there's a chance that the club's going to hit the ground behind the ball so that you start to pull that left arm up. Now, in order for you to do that, it's easier if you keep the head down. So you're keeping the head down for a little bit longer, which causes the right hand to pass the left a little bit quicker. So there are trace elements of your original swing on the one on the left. It was a little bit thin. The one on the right was absolutely flushed. It was perfect. So it was as good a shot as, as you hit during your visit. It was a really, really good shot. And then the other thing we looked at was your um, was your 3D stuff, uh, yourself against Peter. And I'm just going to play this through once for you, or twice for you, just to remind you how close you can get to hitting the ball the way you would want to. So this is a one handicap against an 18 handicap. The biggest difference is the, the amount that that lead arm bends. And the amount that that lead wrist cups through the hip. Coming into impact, you stack up very well against Peter. But through impact, Peter's arms are a little bit straighter for a little bit longer. And his wrist is firmer for longer. And again, it's quite a, when you saw that, it was quite a telling image. Relates to the sort of move that you would make. Left arm bending. Lead wrist cupping. Head staying down, etc, etc. So it's just another look at the move that you would make when you catch it a little bit thin. Or the club closes down too quick. Versus the move that you were making in the same area. On day four. Much better move, much firmer with the lead arm, much firmer with the lead wrist. Good luck with it. If you've got any questions, feel free to email me or get in touch with me on Facebook. Um, look forward to watching this one progressing throughout the year. I think your goal of getting your handicap down by two um, is going to be really easy for you. I mean, if you if you play anything like you played round four and beyond the Monday, uh, round your home course, on greens that you know and conditions that you're familiar with, I think you're going to blow your handicap away pretty quickly. Stick to the process. If you've got any questions, you've got any grey areas, just contact me Contact me immediately. Um, like I say, I look forward to watching this one progress and I look forward to meeting up with you again in the not-too-distant future to either play a little bit of golf 
or work on your game. Good luck with it, and like I say, keep in touch.